I am Vinny Tolerton, folks. Here we are again on the Friday show. Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent when we start this process, but hang in there before long. You shall be lean and mean. That's a money back guarantee. When you think about what you pay for this podcast, you might want to think again. Um, the Friday show, we bring in luminaries, people with way more knowledge than me. I follow this woman on Instagram because I can't get enough of what she's putting up on Instagram. She's always cooking some meat. She has been on the show at least twice before. And we talk about her company twice a week on the show, Bel Campo. I'm talking about the beautiful, the wonderful Miss Anya Fernald. How are you doing, Pumpkin? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on, Vinny. It's always such a pleasure. Yeah, look, I'm not bringing you on for you. I'm bringing you on for me. Because <laughs> it's always a great conversation. We always we, we always get some knowledge. We always learn something from you. Um, but I, I do have before we even get started before we even do your bell campo ad. I, I, I want to get you know, I want to bring something out. I'm, I'm not right, quite sure if you want to talk about it. But I'm hoping you can give us some information on it. Um, there was a, 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 I'll call it Beefgate. There was a problem at Bell Campo for five minutes. And uh, there was a video that went viral. There were a bunch of people who got upset. Um, people were people were calling me people were writing to me on Twitter and uh, my private email uh, was 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 Bell Campo. These people are frauds. What, how can you possibly and I was like, Whoa, 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 frauds? What are you talking about? I, I got caught from behind. I had no idea what was happening. I got in touch with you. You explained it to me. About a week later, you came out and talked about it in social media. Would you mind setting it up? Tell people, tell the audience what happened and how you went about fixing it. Yeah, I mean, the way that you were caught with the information is the same way I was in terms of being blindsided. Um, there's frankly kind of nothing more devastating than just information about something that comes to your knowledge at the same time as it does to the broader public knowledge, especially, you know, brand like Belcampo is something beloved because of its values, right? We've earned trust through integrity. Right. And we had a sourcing issue that was gated primarily to one store in, in Santa Monica. Um, However, the way the information around that source, by sourcing issue, I meant that they were buying products from unapproved vendors. And this was an issue that was really gated to the COVID time um, where there were various issues in supply chain. Um, and the way the information was portrayed, it was a much, it was, it was potentially a much larger issue. Uh, and fortunately we were, you know, I think given the time by our customers to do an investigation, which we did do with the support of a third party to analyze and audit all the purchasing, get our hands around the magnitude of the issue. We published that information. It represented 6% of purchasing in, in 2020. Um, and, and it was no percent in 2019. Um, we, we went back to 2019 to see how long right. the problem existed. And I think once we published that information, you know, there were some customers that said, hey, despite this not being maybe as large an issue as I thought, you still didn't manage the operation well enough in that time. And um, I understand that, um, take accountability for the issues. Um, and there was other customers who said, thank you, we appreciate the transparency. You know, we've, we've all found out by we, I mean, myself and the CEO of the company, um, Gary Embleton, found out at the same time on Sunday and by Monday at noon, we had fixed the issue company wide. Um, so the time with which we were able to fix it, um, I think suggests the size of the issue. Um, we also, you know, made the point, I continue to iterate, does not affect the package products or the products sold on e-commerce. It was really right. restaurant primarily. Well, let, let's explain that because I, I think if people are listening to this podcast, you know, they hear me talking about Bel Campo and the discount and everything. And I think a lot of people might think that you guys just package meat and send it out nationwide. But 
you guys in, in at least where I lived when I was in California, you guys have stores where you can actually go in as restaurants stores means restaurants, folks, uh, where and you could go in and buy and, and sit down and eat, correct? Yeah, we have stores. Um, we have five locations in California that have a mix of butcher shops and restaurants. And those butcher shops have primarily Bel Campo meats and products. They've actually always had some non Bel Campo meats. Like for example, we always have sold Italian prosciutto. So we've always had some non Bel Campo meats, but they're primarily Bel Campo meats. Then we have um, our e-commerce business, which is actually filled directly out of our slaughterhouse um, and our retail business. So we sell in grocery stores also fulfilled directly out of our slaughterhouse and a network of co-packers. So the, the, the issues when I say they're gated to one division, those stores purchased from various vendors, that's where the errors and the lack of oversight occurred, right? That's where we had the, the problems. But the broader way that it was portrayed, I think, um, suggested that everything had sourcing issues and it actually was in reality a smaller piece. That said, there's been a huge um, growth in the company since this information surfaced. I mean, we all got a problem, you know, don't point fingers, look in the mirror, right? And that's really the attitude that I think we've taken company wide is like, okay, this was a this was a problem. We fixed this problem. Uh, how do we get better at communicating, at understanding, right. and telling our consumers where things come from? And we also, you know, kind of another complexity is that starting in 2019, we have been sourcing from other firms. Communicate that on our website. It's traceable on our packages um, by a lot code. But those pieces are are also things that we're now being much more proactive, and we're launching actually a. Um, a label by source program that's launching by a UPC code. So now there's a UPC code. There will be soon on every package that says where things come from exactly. Um, and we're layering in, it's been a mandate to layer in greater levels of, of traceability throughout the supply chain as we grow. You know, Bill Campbell started from one farm, right? It was one farm, um, 30,000 acres, organic certified in Northern California. That farm has always had actually, honestly, a mix of organic and non-organic products, right? That farm has always had species coming in and out. We've had years where our pork was organic and wasn't organic, right? There's always been complexity in ways that we've had to communicate that, but still the story of it being from one farm was the anchor. When we diversified the supply chain that adds a mandate for us uh, to add layers of traceability um, and insight for consumers that, that we're doing. Right. So I see the, you know, the opportunity for growth um, is extremely, extremely uh, troubling and frustrating, um, you know, series of events. I, of course, wish that that information had been surfaced internally and be been given the chance and the leadership to resolve it internally. Um, but it, it went the way it did. And I understand it now in retrospect as a big opportunity for the company to move forward in ways that anticipate um, anticipate issues in a, in a bigger way, just like you understand now. Um, I understand much more about in the way that that story was interpreted about what our consumers want in the future. I'm not sure if that makes sense. So that's been it's been helpful learning for me in that way as well. So just to be clear, uh, anything that's sold in, in uh, grocery stores. Uh, anything that you sell online uh, to my customers and other customers that buy it straight from Belcampo, that wasn't part of the 6%. That was, that was always just, you know, Belcampo meat. Yeah. And, and Vinny, keep in mind, as you know, from buying Belcampo and getting it delivered or when sure. you send the product, if you look at your package of meat, right? Um, the, every package, if it's got a black and white basic label or it's got a pretty label that's been designed on it, it says a number of things, right? It has, says organic certified. It says the word pastured or grass fed and finished, certified humane, different words like that, um, regeneratively farmed. All of those words that are on the package are actually all verified by third party agencies. Right. So there's a level of rigor in anything that's got a label on it um, in terms of our compliance that's unique to that channel. The restaurants and, and butcher shops don't have that extra layer of, of oversight uh, around claims. And that's where the 6% issue happened. So the, the actual you know, a package of ground beef comes out of our slaughterhouse, it's gonna have a USDA organic label on it. That's a third party regulated label um, that has compliance um, implications. So there, that's really, you know, I also would say that this issue um, is gated you know, to purchasing decisions that are localized um, 
the e-commerce and grocery products are all from a centralized, um, from primarily from our slaughterhouse and network of co-packers. So kind of different levels of authority and decision-making too. Does that make sense? It, it does. And, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, there's so much, you know, I, I just did a whole Friday show on disinformation not long ago. And um, it, it's an interesting thing because I have, you know, Anna Vocino and Gina Grad, they, they bring up news stories to me on the show. And I'll just give an example of something that just pops into my mind from like two or three weeks ago. Um, there was a study that said, um, oh, I don't know, it was like for every hot dog you eat, you, you lose 10 minutes of your life. It's 28 but, minutes. I read that. So you, you saw it too. So, but for every, every peanut butter and jelly sandwich you eat, you gain minutes in your life. And whenever I hear something like that, the immediate thought is, okay, the study was never done. It was never done because that study, you can't do it from an epidemiological study. It would have to be a third, um, <clears throat> it would have to be a triple blind study or at least a double blind study. And it would take a lifetime of someone eating hot dogs or not eating hot dogs or eating, uh, you know, uh, you know, PB and J's are not eating PB and J's and that was never done. So number one, it's a non story. Number two, I always ask Gina and or Anna, what's the source. And when it comes from something called mind body green, or, you know, how not to die Michael Greger, or <clears throat> any of these jack wads that are vegan oriented, or if it comes out of Harvard, because that's all vegan. Walter Willett is a big vegan, and he's making policy. And if it comes out of Minnesota University, where Ansel Keys started his reign, all of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's other places, uh, I could go on and on and on. But the bottom line is, when you start seeing this stuff over and over, and you see th this, these erroneous claims, you start sitting there going, okay, well, that's not real. I don't have to dig any deeper to know that a hot dog is going to take 28 minutes off of your life, or a sandwich is going to put 15 minutes onto your life. You just know it's a lie. But guess who doesn't know it's a lie? The general public who just don't do the critical thinking, if that makes any sense, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Go on. Well, there is, a, I think, broadly building, if I can say, on, the, on those kind of piecemeal arguments, um, something that's been interesting to me is that Belcampo, we just released, a, you know, a six month third party reviewed study about carbon sequestration that's based on data that we've been gathering at the farm since 2013. Okay? Oh, we're going to get into that in a second, but, because I want to but go on. So he's showing like 28 pounds of carbon per eight ounce patty of meat. And the response that I get from people is like, you know, if I post it on LinkedIn and Facebook and stuff, it's just like, this is totally crackpot. Like there's no, there's no way that this is true. And I'm, and it's so interesting to me where I say, well, this is like, you know, millennia of farming practices support this data right. broadly. And this is the third party reviewed serious study that dates back to 2013 or not third party. It's a third party conducted study, not third party peer reviewed, but like it's a, it's a level of rigor, which is so different from like the clickbait headline that you get on a vegan story, but still the immediate response is just like, can't be true. And something that I found that on your point around the kind of these like simple arguments, people are 70% more likely to retweet or repost something that they suspect is false. Yeah, 70%. I, 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 I believe that, you know, and I'll never forget when, um, <clears throat> when someone, you know, I, all of a sudden, I started hearing about Bell Campo, and, and obviously, we're hooked to Bell Campo, we, we advertise for you guys. And I was like, what's going on here? And I went on and I saw the video and I went, okay, Critical thinking, there's a video. Where'd the video come from? Is this a disgruntled employee? And I'm not asking, you can answer if you want. I, I don't know if it is or not, but I'm sitting there going, this is obviously someone with an ax to grind, right? Where did this come from? Why is there a video? What, you know, that's the first question you have to ask yourself. Where did all this start? Who, yeah, whose cornflakes did Anya piss into to cause this to come out? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, I'll, I'll speak. And this is, you know, um, 
just in the interest of, you know, owning it with accountability too. I'm, I can't speak to the content of it in any way. You know, I will, I will say something that that employee has put out publicly on his own channels, which is that he shot that video um, minutes or shortly after being uh, terminated. Um, and so that, that's the context that, that was. Okay. Missing, so right? so I, I'm not wrong about that. No, he, he he has he has gone on a, a podcast to speak about it publicly and, and explain the circumstances of his termination. Um, so that that's uh, and I you know this is a case here of anywhere I think with the specifics around that video, the content of it. I I do have opinions about it. I prefer to just keep keep them um, to myself. Um, I think I can speak to saying the issues um, that we owned, we fully own, um, and the way that I think at the company we've dealt with it is very much about increasing compliance, increasing rigor, increasing oversight. And, you know, it's a company that started from a single farm and a couple butcher shops and has grown to e-commerce retail. And so, you know, it's appropriate that we get much more rigorous about traceability and compliance. Sure. It's appropriate. So I think we're taking, and we we're already, and we are certainly doing a better job at it now. You know, so there's definitely, and, and that's not to say that there were issues of concern in the other divisions, but it's like, okay, these are real things that can happen. Let's get very rigorous about ensuring there's third party verifications on everything that we're claiming and talking about and that we're, we're going the extra mile in traceability for the, for the consumer. Um, then, you know, the specifics of operating restaurants and butcher shops, the risk profile around them, that, that is really unique. Um, and, and it has been particularly challenging in the past year to maintain the level of oversight that we had before, just because I wasn't in the stores, right? For example, very, right. I was there extremely frequently, um, as was you know the, the whole sort of leadership team. We've all been concerned that we actually had rules that you weren't allowed to travel to more than one store every two weeks. You know this COVID limitation right. thing. So there's like there's a lot of context there that I think everybody that's listening can kind of fill in. Um, but that said, I I do think. The, the lesson um, is, for me, has just been to see it as an opportunity to get better. Um, and do I wish the information had surfaced in a different way or been able to be handled um, internally? Of course, you know, of course. Um, that said, it's absolutely his right to, to publish and share what he wants to share um, and, and promote it in the ways that he feels appropriate. Well, I love you, man. You, you, you're owning this and you're not, you know, and when I saw that, that, um, that Mayor Copa video you put out a few days later, you, you completely owned it. And uh, you looked right into the camera and said, look, you know, I'm taking the fall for this. I'm taking the blame. You know, we, we have to do better. And I went, wow, I, I'm, I'm just a little bit in love with this woman right now. <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it, it's that sort of deal. Um, that was to me the only response. It's like at that point, yeah. I didn't know the magnitude of it, but it's like, well, whatever it is, we're, we, we already fixed it and we're going to get better and we're going to comb through every stinking inch of this company and make sure there's nothing else like that. And we're, you know, we are growing and I, I want to be an agent of change in regenerative agriculture broadly, right? I want to be an agent of change in regenerative agriculture. I want to create a, a, a platform where many farms can market and sell the highest quality regeneratively farmed beef and pork uh, and poultry. So, you know, Belcampo wants to become uh, a, a, a bigger network, a community of regenerative farms and do that with absolute integrity, traceability and responsibility. So there's, there's definitely um, a lot to learn out of the past summer. In, in achieving that vision, but that vision remains the same. Climate well, policy, and, I can, you know? Yeah, no, I completely understand. Look, when, when I started purevitaminclub.com, our mission, I, I, it wasn't even a state, uh, 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 it was just a mission uh, to put out the best multivitamin in the world. Because whenever I went to Whole Foods or GNC or anywhere, I was like, why? Why do they have other products in here? Why is that in there? And the idea was, how do we create the best multivitamin? One product. I wasn't thinking two products or where are we going to go with this? I was looking for one product to make for myself. And then I learned that in order to make that product, I would have to make at least 100,000 bottles of it. And that would be way too much for me. 
for a lifetime. So I would have to sell it to other people. And that's how purevitaminclub.com got started. But the idea was third party test all of the stuff. First, get the GMP, you know, good manufacturing practice, um, you know, just all of it down, down the list. And then we told the company that we, we went to to build this vitamin. I'm going to be pulling these right off the shelf. You never know when I'm pulling one and I'm testing them. I'm third party testing myself. I'm getting a lab to do this. And that's how we created this whole, you know, integrity and efficacy and everything else around that company. And we've now done that with every product. But to your point, the company is now growing. By the time we got to a vitamin uh, D product, that's a different process, we had to go to a different factory. Now we got to get that tested separately from what we we're doing at the first company, right? So we got to pull that off the line and see what's doing there. And just yesterday, we released our EPA DHA with krill. So I need to make sure that <laughs> the fish I'm getting the fish oil from is exactly what I'm saying it is, right anchovies, because I don't want to lose use large fish, I want to keep small fish. Uh, I got to make sure the krill is the krill I'm saying it is I have to make sure everything. So that's more and more testing, right? That's more, yeah. And every time you bring in another product, you got to test it, you got to keep bringing in more people more tests. And it's not easy. But doing the right thing in life is often not easy. Right? So it's just what you have to do as you go along and you're doing it, I'm doing it. And I wasn't a businessman when I was a kid. I don't think you were a businesswoman. We it's almost like we got thrown into business mm -hmm. because of passion. Am I right about that? Am I wrong about that? Or yeah, absolutely. No, and it's it's um it's interesting to me in the landscape right now, there's a lot of brands and companies trying to do the right thing and to take these very small niche products and make them more available on a wider scale because fundamentally we think they're the right thing to do, right? Right. So there's going to be a moment where it's like the these opportunities for growth that COVID presented us, right, around direct to consumer and consumers being more concerned about health and more interested in brands and you know COVID actually shifted consumers to being more brand aligned, like actually being more interested in buying branded products and non branded products. Right. So there's like some really interesting trends that are supporting um, smaller values driven brands right now. And I think there's opportunities, right? And all those opportunities mean that we have to rescale. You know, with Belcampo, we actually were, broke the mold in, in building scale by building our own slaughterhouse, right? To be able to control the supply chain and be able to offer something without these, these, these some of these hurdles that other small ranchers had had. Um, so, it's been an interesting, you know, an interesting journey um, to to be able to understand um, how to provide this at scale that's meaningful. I really I do think that there's potential for high quality grass finished beef, high quality pasture pork and poultry to take into the mainstream. There's yeah. such clear evidence about the impact on climate. There's such clear evidence about the support of good, vibrant health. And it just seems to me, it's like enough people, you know, start to do their research, look online, read the books, watch a couple movies and videos, and they're gonna understand the importance of, of doing this and making these choices. And I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future of lots of companies that are playing in that space because I think there's an opportunity to provide better meat. Um, there's a there's a market that's waiting to find it. Um, wow. But these are operations like Belcampo. I mean, Belcampo, we started with 600 cows, actually 450. We currently have 3,500. And um, we then purchase in an additional, this year, I think about 30% of our beef is coming from our partner farms, our network of like right now, we've got about eight beef farmers in the region that we're buying from as well. So there's, you know, there's a, it's, it's grown a lot, right? But it's still a teeny, teeny, tiny player. So there's going to be yeah. so much growth in the next couple of years for everybody in the space. Um, and, but that's going to involve, uh, and, and mean creating, you know, new, 
new systems and new ways of doing things. It's like rebuilding a localized economy in some ways, um, using the infrastructure of a bigger one. And that's like you're saying too, there's, you built a brand and a company that's highly verified in the industry of supplements. I mean, supplements is famously murky, right? Yeah. I, I was like noodling around um, with a potential supplement product that we're not pursuing, but I was amazed to learn that organic certification in the supplement industry, you can have up to 30% by volume of the product be non-organic certified. Oh, organic means nothing. I was in the supplement industry. Way, Vinny. I was blown away. I'm like, how? I mean, literally in our products, oh my gosh, like the if if it's like you have one pinch of paprika in the merguez sausage, and there's you don't have, you know, the organic certification on file and the inspectors there, it's like that entire batch is in the dumpster. Yeah. Right. So you can't have it, and that would be like less than one percent by far, like less than one percent of one percent and by volume. So supplements is, is like by design, a pretty murky industry. And, um, I think I I sort of wonder why. And one thing I've speculated by is like the amount that people are taking is so small and it's all desiccated that actually the toxicity risk is pretty low. So maybe that's part of why it's allowed to kind of like emerge, or maybe it's like liquor where it's just so heavily lobbied you know, that people are able to get away with it. I, I, think, I think that's it. Yeah, it, it's a it's a bazillion dollar industry and nobody wants to see it go away. But that's that's what allows companies like Pure Vitamin Club to, to just jump right on top. And look, there are other companies like ours out there, but they're very few and in between. Um, most companies just put out crap. Look, I wish I could do that. I wish I could just put out crap. I would make a lot of money right? I would be able to scale up even faster. I would be a bazillionaire right now. But I, I've taken the long road. And, you know, to be quite honest, you know, at, at least I can sleep at night, you know, I'm not going to get rich, but I can sleep at night. Speaking of sleeping at night, folks, I never go to bed without eating any bel campo meat. We're talking to Anya, the woman who started with 450 cattle, cows, cattle, how would you say that? Cow, beef. Beef. Yeah, that's how people say it. Um, yeah. Look at her now. They got 3,500. Still not the kind of like hockey stick growth, but hopefully with the, the farms and our partner network and our supply chain network, that number will be massive. I mean, the power that regenerative beef ranching has to change ecosystems and change the planet, it's, it's epic. I mean, it's a massive potential to reverse climate change and to sequester more carbon. So the, the practice of doing it is like, we know how to do it. People know how to do it. It's now a question of like, can we generate the market and drive the market for regenerative beef that actually improves climate outcomes? Well, I, I'm sure you can. And look, my mom just signed up for Belcampo because they're down in Louisiana and um, she, she didn't trust going to the grocery. She's like, hey, these grocery stores have been closed for several days. The generators weren't working. I don't know if that beef is, I said, Ma, let's go to Belcampo, get the 15% discount. She goes, how do I do that? I said, just put my name in. She goes, if I put your name, I said, yeah, mom, I'm kind of famous. 15% <laughs> Bel Campo promo like code. Like to something, Vinny. Yeah, it was like, ma, look at me. I'm somebody. I'm in my basement. I'm like, uh, what, what was that? Uh, I can't think of the movie. But anyway, Bel Campo, 15% off. Don't fall asleep on the meatballs. Wait, we can ask Anya. Are the meatballs in stock right now? They are in stock. And Get then the we, meatballs. Meatball coming out soon. Have you tried the 93.7 beef, the 93% lean beef? I know you're a fan of fat because you're I'm a fan of fat. So I'm going to say we didn't, Serena gets it. So I'm going to guess she didn't get that. Okay. Well, I know you're a fan of fat and I'm a fan of fat too, but I have been eating the 93.7 like almost. I'm, I'm writing it down. Um, so it's like a, it's a very lean ground beef. And here's what I do with it. Um, I, I like to mix it for a pound of beef. I'll add about two teaspoons of cumin, a teaspoon of paprika. I'll grate in like two cloves of garlic with my microplane yeah. um, and add a teaspoon of salt, maybe some fresh parsley, some water, a little olive oil, and just mix it together in the stand mixer. And then put mm -hmm. that in the fridge uh, and let it kind of hang out and marinate with the spices. I'll do like two or three pounds at a time and then make it into patties and cook it in olive oil or in suet and make um, kofta. Like it's like a kofta patty. Um, so if you're eating a lot of meat, like you and I do, and it's just like kind of a grind to say, okay, I'm going to have another hamburger patty with something on it. The 93, seven, it's like texturally a little different. It actually, you know, I'm not eating ground beef out of a package raw ever. Typically. Right. 
because of, and at Bel Campo notwithstanding, it's just in general, I don't want meat that's been cut a long time in advance that I'm eating raw. When I right. eat my raw meat, I'm typically taking like a picanha and I'm just chopping that up and eating it raw or I'm grinding right. it up in my, in my Roboku, my, my Cuisinart or something. But um, that 93.7, I season it with that kofta mix and then I'll just make it into a patty and cook it like hot and fast, crusty with a nice kind of rare slice in the middle. That is delicious eating and it's a kind of meal prep hack that's just so easy to incorporate into your life. My mouth is watering just listening to this. It's uh, I should just get you on every Friday and just let you talk to me well, about meat. The other thing you do with it, do you, you eat dairy, right? You eat dairy? Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't live without it. So I take a cucumber and grate that with my microplane after I grate the garlic. So it's a little bit garlicky. Put that with some Greek yogurt and mix that together with salt, Greek, Greek yogurt and grated cucumber. And then you'd like dip the kofta into that yogurt cucumber. Nice. Kind of quick sasiki that is so delicious and it's just like and you can make it into like i've done it for people coming over like make it into a kebab put it on a skewer and cook it like a kind of like a like you might like imagine like a street food you know like a big long i gotta get to your house god i gotta get there that's like that's the latest thing that i've been doing that's just so simple and so delicious i've been trying to find ways to do meal prep um of like raw meats that i can keep in the fridge for fast yeah. Because I just think it's an, an easy, I like to do things for my own life that I, that are helpful to coach other people about healthy eating. Um, and the other one like that, that I'll, well, I've got the mic is um, I make a good classic Italian vinaigrette, you know, where you do like a cup of olive oil, uh, maybe a third a cup of lemon juice, third a cup of uh, red wine vinegar, some bay leaves, crushed garlic, big handful of dried oregano, some salt that I'll put um, stew meat into like chunks mm -hmm. of stew meat and yeah. keep that in the fridge and then cook them in my air fryer or saute them. And again, do that medium rare. So I love having those kind of like marinated raw meats. And it also does extend shelf life. You know, you can keep right. something marinated like that for a week when it's out of the package after it's been thawed. Um, so those are those are two hacks lately that I've been really loving for my, my daily protein. Folks, you heard it from the horse's mouth. Go get her cow. Bel Campo, 15% off. Promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, will get you 15% off. If after the promo code you spent more than $100, you get uh, free shipping. That ain't, that, that's not, you know what they say, you, that, that means a lot when it comes to uh, shipping beef because they got to pack it and the whole thing and it shows up frozen. You got to make sure to get right over $100 after the promo code. Belcampo.com, promo code Vinny. No wimpy why we're talking to Anya for Anya. I'm working on a movie, I thought it was going to come out before the end of the year, it's going to be up for pre sale before the end of the year. And it will be out in January, we had to push it just a little bit, we couldn't make all of our deadlines. But um, I'm doing a whole movie because I was watching this fake uh, meat industry just come alive over the past couple of years, it was like, we used to goof on it, laugh about it and everything else. And uh, now with this impossible meat and beyond burgers and everything else, this industry is getting bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden, I see Tyson and, and some of these other big meat companies getting, you know, putting dropping a billion dollars here and there to get into this, right? Like the, the meat companies are hedging their bets to to start this crap. And I'm sitting there going, Okay, What's good about this? Because, you know, in the movie, I go into all the ingredients in this stuff, you know, it's like, you know, it's manufactured. Uh, you want to talk about greenhouse gases, a lot of the stuff is manufactured, as I've learned, and you'll see in the movie, in China, it's got to be shipped, that takes some kind of fuel to get it here, greenhouse gases, you got to do it in a factory, greenhouse gases. And what you end up with is this abomination of a junk food that they're saying number one is healthier than red meat, that is not causing any greenhouse gases. It's all a lie. We have politicians who are saying, we want meatless Mondays, we want meat to go away. The most meat anyone should ever eat is a little cube. It's, it's bizarre what we're doing. As a matter of fact, um, a friend of mine, I was telling him, I said, you know, in my movie, um, and by the way, Anya, I don't do politics on this show. I'll, I'll just let you know that. I don't care if you're on the right or the left. 
but if I talk about a politician, I'll just talk about him. I'm, I don't have an agenda against that politician. And I said to my friend, I said, you know, um, our vice president, when she was running for the presidency before she got the vice president job, she was talking about getting rid of meat altogether. And he goes, No, she wasn't. I went, Oh, no, we, I, she was I, I actually have video of her saying this 10 to she's never said to get rid of meat. She does not want to get rid of meat. She's not she's all for, I went, no, no, I don't think you understand. She's against me. And I said, there's another guy there who was a vegan that was running. I can't think of his name. Now he was a really good looking uh, African American guy. He wants to get No, he doesn't. They don't want to get rid of me. So I showed him the video, the same video I'm using in my movie, by the way. I said, here it is. He goes, that's not what she's saying. When she's saying, yes, we got to get meat out of schools. We got to get rid of meat. Meat is not good for your health. Yet people are out there saying, oh, she's not saying that at all. What say you? Um, I, I know it's a load. And this is not a Kamala Harris thing. I'm just saying that all, I'm sure I could find someone on the right who's saying the same thing. I'm just using that as an example. It's yeah, it's it's incredibly um, confusing to me uh, how the political alignment around these issues has landed. Right, like it, in some ways, regenerative agriculture. I mean, there just to say that that basically we're seeing this support of hyper large monocropping tons of imported products, um, heavy reliance on genetically modified uh, crops that in turn are extremely reliant on very toxic, proven bad chemicals to produce anything, that that has become this darling of, of the left, right? Like I don't really understand enough to, I feel like it's just people smarter than me can maybe explain that, why this political alignment has landed the way it has. That said, it's an extremely political issue and it, it, it doesn't align with the, the data. I do think you have to follow money on this one. And yep. you mentioned, Vinny, that the big meat companies are doubling down on anti-meat uh, meats. And that's, a, that's been going on for years. Um, the other people that are doubling down on it are the large processed food companies. Um, and I think part of it, one macro trend is the consumption of the conventional kind of American mainstays of things like breakfast cereal and breakfast bars and like nutrigrain bars and processed canned soups, all of those are a steady decline quarter on quarter for like the past like 15, 18 quarters, apart from during COVID peak when they kind of notched up because there's all the return to comfort food. Right. So there's a steady decline in the American diet and their reliance on shelf-stable, ultra-processed foods that are primarily made from ultra-processed ingredients. Um, and you, you know, ultra-processed are, but for the benefit of maybe some of your listeners who don't know, it means, means foods that are like made from food ingredients. So ingredients that are derived from foods, but are not actually foods. Right. Um, and that's, I mean, it's the difference between like a dried apple and then like a fruit, a fructose extracted from an apple. Right. right. So the fructose is a hyper processed ingredient. So all these foods that are relying on those ingredients are in a steady decline in their portion of the American plate. Um, so what's going to, how are those businesses going to thrive in the future? And I think processed meats, so these processed meat alternatives are like, well, here's the hyper or ultra processed reliant non-food based food that could represent a growing category in the future. So a lot of it's just that it's like, well, people aren't buying canned soup anymore. And what are we going to, what else are we going to have them make out of all this, the hyper-processed cereals and grains and legumes that is palatable and they're going to want to put in their kids' lunch boxes and cook for dinner. So part of it's just that. And then the, the other part of it is that the broader meat industry is, really problematic. And the alternative meat industry is not at a scale yet to offer viable scaled alternatives with enough variety for most consumers. So you know that I'm obsessed with our meatballs and we joke about our meatballs because they're fabulous meatballs. But like that product, getting that product to market was a huge lift. We're working now on a chicken bite that's gluten-free and keto-friendly. We're working on a, the chicken meatball I mentioned. We've got steak strips. 
but it's tiny. It's like just a couple products and it's a huge lift for us to get them. You look at what mainstream meat has to offer. There's so much variety. Um, there's so many ready to eat products. There's so many seasoned products. So the issue is that the whole consumer trends migrating towards all these kind of like semi-prepared, prepared meats and what, and then consumers are looking at, you know, the, the, you look at a mom in America and she's reading like, okay, this is bad for the planet and bad for my health. This hot dog is going to take 28 minutes off of my kid's life. I know that Belcampo's hot dogs don't take 20 minutes off of your life. I think they add a couple minutes, but they're that- actually a study was just done. It adds 12 minutes, <laughs> but you have to cook it. You got, you got to boil it for at least six minutes. <laughs> I don't what know. If in a sauna, Cause sauna is prolonged life. Then it's like, does it amplify? <laughs> <laughs> so eating bell is a new study. It's the end of one eating bell campus, uh, hot dogs in the sauna. Yeah, they, they are, look at Anya. She's 85 years old. She doesn't look a day over 32. It, it works. Folks. Exactly. Exactly. So you, you know, you have a lot of factors around the finances of these big um, alternative meat companies. And then there's another question too, where, you know, if, if you look and these are, this is information that's widely available, but uh, at the amount of money that's gone into these large, in these large, like kind of what called like food tech and food innovation, it's huge amounts of investments. It's billions and billions of dollars have gone in to alternative meats. So, if I'm wondering why all of a sudden does everybody think that natural meat from real animals that are grown naturally on pasture slowly is bad for them. And I look at how much we spend on marketing and how much other farms like us have spent on marketing. And I compare that to what the big meat alternatives have spent and the amount of gas that they threw the amount that they way they just push the pedal to the metal on marketing. Yeah. You know, here in, in San Francisco area, like on the BART stations, like our little metro transport, I remember for two years, every single sign in the BART was like, real meat's bad, this is better. Real meat's bad, this is better. So it's like so much money. It's not like we all went crazy. It's like, no, we were sold a very specific bill of goods um, with a very, and there's there's no kind of fact checking on that. So we've shown that Bill Campo has our burgers, every eight ounce patty, every package of of one pound package of beef sequesters over 50 pounds of carbon and the company net, like net of methane, net of FedEx shipping, net of trucks and restaurants and everything net sequestered more than 25,000 tons of carbon in wow. 2020. Okay. So our operation and that net is all due to the beef, yeah. right? We don't have the long-term tracking on the chickens. We don't have like, there's lots of different reasons why, but we're basically measuring just our own beef herd on our own lands not our partner farms, not our anything else, just our own beef herd, that is sequestering so much carbon through regenerative farming that it offsets every other activity in the company significantly. Wow, okay, but that information is not anywhere out there. It's not like the ad for Impossible Foods is like, hey, here's, real beef is bad, um, this beef is better, but by the way, there's a real beef that's actually way better than both of these options. Right. Right. But, but that, that's not in their best interest. You know, I have people like Mitt Lerner in my new movie. I don't know if you know, Frank, and, uh, you know, he talks about how, you know, your ruminants are not causing all the greenhouse gases. It's actually saving the planet. And, you know, I could have gotten a, a ton of other experts, but, you know, I brought in what I needed to get an 80 minute movie done. And it's amazing how most people just don't know this, you know, it's, it's amazing how, but you're right. It's everywhere you look, you know, you have some kids saying, how dare you? And the world is going to hell in five minutes if we don't change by tomorrow. And, uh, you, you know, it's, it's just these campaigns that come out of nowhere. One of my favorites is, you know, they'll get these little vegan zealots saying that, you know, I won't kill anything. We don't have to kill anything to eat. And I'm putting a movie out that's going to show how much has to die just for you to eat a slice of bread. It will and also, it's not pretty. Even the stuff around health, you know, I, I have uh, just in, in the interactions with like people in my neighborhood and my, the, my kids, you know, parents, people, when they are on a, when they say, Oh, I'm on a diet, I want to lean out. They're eating, they're, they're getting rid of meat. That's the first step. 
right like, get rid of fat get rid of meat and i'm like is this 1996 what's going on here <laughs> um you know it's it's crazy to me i recently had experience with a, a friend of a friend in my house i said hey i got some steak and oh no i can't do this guy's pounding a huge bag of like mango chips and I'm thinking, how, wait, what, where, when? Ugh. I do this all the time. Like I do videos all the time about how to render fat, how to cook with healthy animal fats. And people are, are you worried about your cholesterol? And I'm like, let me show you my panel. <laughs> like, this is, I'm doing great, right? So it's like, there's, there's also major misinformation about what it does for our bodies, right? And that's another piece where, I mean, look at the food the food pyramid, the, tr the triangle of, 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 you know, of, um, of American business is what that is. The triangle of vested yeah. interests in the American economy is what that is, where it says eat tons of grains, doesn't really matter hyper-processed or not. 11 on the day. bottom every day, 11 servings of grains every day. Every day. And Can then you imagine if you ate that, how fat you would be? That's the thing. So it's like, we just look at this and we've all just sort of like, I also think that the U.S. is kind of like, just sort of like relinquished itself to just generalized overweight and ill health. And just said, you know, if you watch even like, I'm not sure if you watched the Olympics this year and watching network TV now, like 45, 50% of the ads are all for, you know, pharmaceuticals to manage health issues that are diet related health issues. Yeah. Right. There's even now drugs to manage your negative responses to other drugs that are being advertised. Oh, we, we, we've been talking about that on the Monday show. We'll play the actual ads We'll take a 30 second ad, I will break it down. Every time the announcer says something, I'll stop it and go, okay, here's what he's saying. And yeah. then at the end, they'll say, okay, you're going to fix this one problem. But you're going to get these 30 problems from that drug. Yeah. No one really understands that because a doctor would just say take this pill. And you know, look, Anya, I'm turning 59 in two weeks. And Every time I'm talking to old friends of mine from high school, they'll go, how many medications are you on? Are you on? And I'll say none. And they'll say, come on, none. I say, none. none. I'm 59. I take zero, big zero, nothing. Right? How is that? How is it every time I go in to get any test done, my cholesterol is within some normal range that they call normal, right? Mm -hmm. This is their normal range. Yet, I eat somewhere between six and 12 eggs every day. I eat red meat daily, sometimes most days, twice a day. Um, when I'm not eating that, I'm eating fish or I'm eating chicken. How am I not dead? Well, you know, but you'll see these ads on television, and you said 40 to 50%? Oh, it's yeah. higher than that. It's yeah. higher than that. It's crazy. These ads are nuts. But this is where I think there's a, there's, so there's, if you're a, if you're, you know, 32 year old mom working a full-time job, have some kids, have the, the busy life and you're getting, you don't have a lot of time to educate yourself. Think about the, the advice that you've got around you. And of course you're going to think you should be vegan. Of course you're going to feel guilty about eating meat. And you think about how much of your, of your eye bandwidth is being purchased now with the reliance on social media, it's like 99%, right? Oh. Of actual media that we get that's not targeted, tailored, purchased, were bought and sold. So the information, it's, like, it's an actual misinformation campaign. And it, it needs to be thought of. I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's a massive conspiracy behind it, but between the misinformation around health and the misinformation around the environment, it's, it's extremely misleading. And so I just feel like empathy for people who, who don't um, have access to the whole picture of information. And I, I think unfortunately, you know, meat is becoming, and clean meats becoming a real privilege. And it's almost like these hyper-processed meats are being foisted on people without the socioeconomic resources or the, or the privilege of time. Oh, don't say that because you will become a racist in two seconds. You gotta be well, careful. Well, I, I'd say just access to, you know, if you even just look in the way that um, in grocery stores, right, the way that these products are being marketed too, you know, like it's, it's pretty, it, it, it's, it's, to me, it looks like this is if saying you, if you're trying to make a better choice for your health and for the environment, and you don't have access to the time or resources to learn a lot, you're going to make that choice for a processed plant-based meat. Right.
even if you're, you know, the smartest person on earth, you just, there, it's just science. It's just like probability, like looking at the information that you have available, the way that you're being marketed to, unless you've got access to people like you and podcasts and you're kind of in this alternative world, you're going to fall for this bigger story. And that's extremely unfortunate because I think the people who are making the choices for plant-based meat are extremely well-intentioned, right? I think they're trying to do the right thing. They're not doing it as it tastes better, right? They're doing it for the right, right. Well, you, you, let, let's go back to what you said about two minutes ago. Uh, you don't know if it's a massive conspiracy or not. It's not a conspiracy. Um, you know, I've always said, I, I don't have anything against anyone who became vegan because they're just trying to do the right thing. I have trouble with these, these doctors who are vegan, who are telling people this massive lie, and they know they're lying. But when it comes down to the truth, it's just big companies doing what big companies do. They're selling at you, right? They don't care what the product is. They don't care about the end result. They just care about selling you a product. There's no conspiracy in that whatsoever. But the another, a challenge though on that too, Vinny, would be like, if you look at it from a pure health perspective, if you look at commodity meat, right? Mm -hmm. At like the most rock cut commodity meat, super high in omega-6s, I mean, not a, not a great quality product. And you look at that compared to a, a traditional vegan diet of that where you actually eat vegetables and olive oil and stuff. I'd say that the traditional vegan diet is probably healthier than a it, diet. It is, no, it, it is healthier. When, and you see, whenever they do the comparison, okay, let me, let me go. I, I was working, I was getting to that. So the companies don't care what you eat. They just want to survive and do what they do. They want to sell to you. But now they have a problem. They have to tell you that, you know, processed foods are better than fresh food. How are they going to do that? Well, they have to get to people like Walter Willett over at Harvard. They have to get to, they have to get to the WHO, the World Health Organization. They have to get to these different groups. And when you have companies the size of Unilever and Kraft and all these big companies, they can pay these guys to squint and lie because Anytime you take epidemiological studies, you, you don't have to squint a whole lot to make it say what you want it to say. So now you have articles coming out saying Harvard says A, B, C, and D, because they have one of the biggest vegans there in the world, Walter Willett, right? And he gets his scientists to just squint just enough to make these lies happen. So now people start eating this crap. So let's say you're a vegan. And you, you know, you go into vegan veganism for health reasons. I don't have a problem with you. You're trying to do the right thing. And I applaud that. But then you start looking around and you'll go, wait a minute. I don't have time to go get you know, If I put a fresh apple in my car, it can go bad before I eat it. A banana can get mushy before I eat it. You know, a tomato sweats and you know, before I know it, it goes bad. But you know, I can have a granola bar. I can have this, I can have that. Before you know it, you're eating the crap that they want you to eat, all under the name of veganism, all under the name of this is healthier for you. It's, after all, it's Nature Valley. What could be better? It says nature right in the name. And Valley, come on, that sounds good too. Nature Valley, that sounds terrific. And then you have all of these companies doing the wrong, you know, doing that because they're just selling at you. And you have the person who's trying to do the right thing, getting the bad stuff, and then they could take it to the next level. They go back to Walter Willett and they go, okay, look, we got to make meat bad. How do you do that? Well, if we take, if we take Anya Fernald's meat, that's not going to look very good. But you know what? Oscar Mayer makes this crappy bologna. Uh, let, let's just take the bologna and just do that. Let's just take the crappy meat made by, by Jimmy Dean or Oscar Mayer, or any of these companies. Let's study that. Right. And that's how they get to it. And then they mix that in with what Anya Fernald is doing over at Belcampo. Do, do you see how it all works yeah. in how it all figures well, itself out? You know, I get this as well, though, because if you look at what can you buy if you live in Des Moines, it's that product from Oscar Mayer, you know, so if you're trying to compare it to a true American available meat, we have we have chosen poor meat for decades, right. we've chosen cheap meat for decades. 
And so now if you're looking to be a you know, responsible scientist and analyze things, not to defend these guys, but it's like, well, you're going to go against, you're going to compare it up against what's the conventional widely available meat. And look at America chose crummy confinement meat for, for decades. We chose to support farms where mother pigs were caged and unable to roll over for the entirety of their lives. We chose to support farms where laying chickens were starved to forced molt and produce more and die. Well, Anya, go back. We didn't choose to do that. But we That's chose what, that. We bought the product. We didn't know what we were choosing. We didn't know. But I also think it's like everything. It's accountability and kind of extreme ownership. <laughs> on things. You know, we chose in the average dairy cow, I've heard statistics, lives less than two years in the U.S. In Europe, they live uh, over a dozen years. Uh, because they're forced to produce 15 gallons a day as a, compared to like three gallons a day in, in European dairies. Like yeah. we, we choose this hyper consumption, pedal to the metal, like consequences out the window approach. We get this cheap product. And, you know, when you look at a supermarket aisle and you see chicken breasts on sale, 99 cents a pound, you should be nauseated. Yeah. You shouldn't be at all enticed or excited or be thinking about a barbie. You should be nauseated. Like that's a horrific outcome. That means really bad things happened on the way to the grocery store. Yeah. But most people now are like, oh, cool. That's great. I could freeze those. Right? You know, we don't have this mentality where we see cheap prices and we're like, whoa, that probably involves some pretty gnarly sacrifices around integrity and quality. Instead, we say, oh, interesting. Well, probably okay. You know, like you don't, we're not questioning things. We're taking these cheap prices and we're not understanding the consequences. And then the result of that mentality is that the mainstream available product is pretty crummy when compared to, you know, other plant-based alternatives, right? So it's like we lowered the bar on meat low enough that now it's not really clear which is better. It's clear though that there is a better quality meat that you can seek out. And to be clear, you know, Bocampo is one option and every town in America has a cool regenerative ranch within a hundred miles now. I mean, maybe not every single time. All right, so wait, let me play devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. Because before I knew Anya Fernald, and I still use this company, uh, Polyface is right down the street from my house. Oh, you know? yeah. So they're, they're great, you know, they're, there's great farms out there where you could just go, you can watch them slaughter your 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 beef. You know, you can be there and, and do the whole thing. And um, I like that idea, but, you know, we're empty nesters, we, we, we're not broke. We can afford that. Uh, what you know? What will it take for the Polyface, the Bell Campos, you know, um, you name it, all these companies that are out there doing the right thing? What will it take for those companies to grow to a position where they can lower their prices and compete with that? Is, is that a possibility? Do do you see that in our lifetime? Is that something Bell Campo would like to work towards, along with people like Polyface and on and on and on? I, I don't think there's a way that we can ever meet the price point of conventional meat today. So that that that's the problem, right? I mean that you know we you know anyone listening to this podcast if they, if they have a cell phone they can they can afford your meat pretty much, but not everyone can do that. So what you know as a nation. What do you think, do you, and I know I'm putting it on oh, spot, but what is the answer? Also point out, you know, our ground beef is $9.99 a pound. Okay. Right. The steaks are more expensive than, but the gap of $9.99 a pound compared to conventional ground beef, it's, it's not the, it's not 5X, right? Right. So there's products that are closer that are more in the ballpark. I, I think we have to, can, another point, key point to call out here around pricing, Vinny, Every year in America, 1 billion chickens and 100 million other animals are thrown away in the form of food waste. Let's say that again. Wow. A billion chickens, 100 million other forms of livestock like cows and, and sheep. 100 million animals, like an animal equivalents, like nauseating that represents this this statistics is fuzzy different people say different things but it's somewhere around like 25 to 30 percent of all meat produced it's a crazy America. amount of meat what what happens what's going on there well have you ever been to a buffet right if you put meat out on a buffet like you do in every college campus and every you know steakhouse restaurant you can't use it the next day when it's been at temp all day 
right? right? So there's one big source of it. Also, meat is so stinking cheap that, I mean, trust me, the, the amount of caviar that's wasted in, in the US is probably less than 1%, right? Uh, right? Expensive prices drive caution. That good olive oil that you guys sell, what? how much do you think people waste really high quality olive oil in restaurants? They don't. I, I, I literally cut the can open and lick, totally, lick the inside totally. out. I did the same thing. I'm like, don't throw that away. There's still one drop left, right? Like yeah. you're careful with things that you know are expensive. Um, I mean, I eat my Parmesan rinds because I'm like, that's like, <laughs> that's like. I just much. shared one with my dog before we started this podcast. She's jerky. I mean, and I don't eat, you know, I, like you, you have that mentality. It's like, you know, that, that piece of cheese was like 14 bucks. Like, let's, let's just save that rind. I might eat yeah. it. I might put in pasta sauce, but it's not going in the trash. Wait, Anya, let me tell you, let me tell you, my, let me tell you my food thing. Whenever I'm grading it and I get down to the rind, I'll grade the grind into the rest of it and just mix it in. Yeah, well, Parmesan actually they use yeah. no, they manually remove the mold with scrubbing. Pretty yeah, much. The yeah so it, the, the rind is just like good. Gouda, you know, Gouda, they actually use an anti-mold chemical to keep it so yeah. and, and that you don't want to eat the rind of Gouda. I didn't mean to get you off, but you can, you go, go, go back. Yeah. Cheese all day long. Yeah. Um, so, but, but you know, you, you actually have a huge, so let's just think, let's just like have a little creative moment where gosh, what if we only threw away like um, 5% of meat? Because meat was a little more expensive and people, you know, valued it more. But you said 30%, right? That billion came to like 30%. So that might, 25% would be okay. the meat right. there. So that would mean effectively we would have 25% more budget for our food, right? For our meat. Right. Right. Because we'd be able to spend a little more for a little less of it and use it all and have the same net nutritional impact. So there's, there's the cheap meat paradigm is pretty broken in a lot of ways. And I actually think it needs to, it needs to be fully broken. I think it actually needs to be exploded um, for things to get better because we also have the sensitivity around meat prices. You know, every time I buy a phone, I spend a thousand bucks, right? Right. Uh, unless I line up right and I have the upgrade. And, and I, I do that like what every, I don't know, I have kids, so these things are always breaking, but like every year, eight months or something. And then when they sit, they say, hey, you got to spend this extra $20 a month for this extra thing. I'm like, no problem. The home, like all these different things, you just add on these dollars. Right. And I have a budget around that. And the same thing goes, I, I go and buy like a green juice and it's $11. And I'm like, oh yeah, totally worth it. I, everybody has, I mean, th these are, okay, green juice is definitely, you know, privileged too, but like there's a lot of these foods and expenses and things, vitamins too, we're really comfortable spending more on because we sort of associate them with wellness, with functionality. With meat, we have a commodity mentality and the, the commodity mentality, you can really think about as milk too. Milk used to be a total commodity, right? There was no organic milk in stores. It was only you could buy it direct from farms and it was raw and it was really weird. And you had to go somewhere and it was big and complicated. It's like in the seventies and milk was perceived as a commodity. Stores always had milk for at the time, like under $2 a gallon, right? That was right. like a lost leader for stores. In the 1980s, some of the information about the bovine growth hormone impact on babies and the environment and just bad stuff came out about the milk industry. Consumers started to ban it and consumers got a, they started to decommodify milk. Now you go into the milk section, there's like 50 different types of milk, right? Crazy. Um, yeah. And it's crazy. And there's some, I buy milk sometimes when I'm feeling spendy, that's like $12 for a half gallon because A2 and got the cream top and we make this thing at home and don't buy it every time, but it's like a big expense and it's really, really great. Yeah. And it, it, there's this huge experience around milk. Same thing goes with butter. Meat hasn't really had that yet. You know, think about it. So the, the decommodification of a product is a, is, a, is a thing that takes a while. And the meat industry is more consolidated because milk, here's another kind of funny factor with it. Milk was always a regional brand because oh, of the yeah. Okay, so it decommodified faster because regional brands were already players and regional brands were able to move more nimbly, right? In the 70s and 80s, these regional brands kind of popped off organic ones. Then they developed, I mean, the great example here in the Bay Area is Clover Stornetta, fabulous family owned business, fourth generation family runs it now classic kind of, you know, regular old dairy, regional, et cetera. Now they've got like organic um, grass fed milk for sale in every local grocery store, as well as their general milk. Like they've got different lines because they were able to decommodify and offer different meat industry has been slower to make those changes, but that process of decommodification and the spread just to get in there with, with a clover sternetta is like, I think they have products at like $4.99 for a half gallon and $8.99 for a half gallon. So they've got a big spread. You're going to see the same thing happen in meat now. 
now. It's just happening slower because the meat industry is more centralized than dairy um, because of the shipping and it ships frozen, right? So there's some logistical right. reasons why it's, it's, it's centralized and not decentralized like the milk industry is and was. Um, and it's just slower to change. Um, you know, meat industry uh, only, I think, under 10% of, of beef is slaughtered outside of like the three major players, right? It's like highly centralized, highly centralized. That's why when you saw the issues in COVID with meat processing, it was so such a massive impact because everything goes to this really tight bottleneck. So you're going to see a decommodification. And by decommodification, I mean, consumers are going to be given the right to pay more for something that better represents their values. That's what decommodification is. It's like here, Benny, here's an opportunity to spend three bucks more for something that you feel better about buying. And you're like, cool, right. I'll take the opportunity. You know? So that's a, an opportunity that you're going to be given now, that the American consumer is going to be given now. But it's an opportunity that we're kind of like earning, right? And it's going to take a while to happen because of the nature of the industry that we're in. Yeah, you know, I, I can't wait for that to happen. I'm always, you know, I, I talk about this privately. I always go, you know, I, I can afford this stuff, but not everyone can. And I'm my, it's always my guess. And that's a great, that's a great example as to how it's going to happen. You know, I'm always trying to figure out how does how does everyone you know, when I built my vitamin company going back to that. You know, when I was a kid, I, I always tell the story. <clears throat> I wasn't that much of a kid, I was already in New Orleans, and I was in college. And then I started working for these really wealthy people on up and down St. Charles Avenue, and uh, in Ottoman place. And I noticed that rich people had cars that we didn't have out in the countryside called Mercedes. Right. And they would always have 10 year old Mercedes, and they had diesel engines. And um, I would ask about these cars. And, oh, yeah, yeah, you buy a Mercedes with a diesel, and you keep it for 15 years. And then we, we, you know, you get another one, they last forever. And when okay, you pay more for them. But you get to keep them for a long time. And then all of a sudden, Toyota, you get the same kind of quality, maybe even better quality than Mercedes, but it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. So now you have the best of both worlds, mm -hmm. right? When I came up with Pure Vitamin Club, I went, I want to build a Toyota. Mm -hmm. I want to build the quality of a Mercedes diesel at a Toyota price. And that's where we have to get with all of this stuff, mm -hmm. right? We, you know, what's that word decommodification? I love that. I got to say, I got to co-op that word because I've never heard it before, but I like it. And I'd love to talk to you more about it because you, you, you know, I'm always sitting and thinking, how do we get there? How you know, I'm, I'm doing this movie, and I'm looking at all this fake meat and all of these people lying to people. And I'm, I'm sitting there going, how do we get past this? You know, I'm not sure I'm giving the solution in the movie, I'm, I'm presenting the problem, right? But there is no solution. There is no, how do we fix this? I'm just telling people, hey, here's a problem. That's not the answer. I'm not sure what it is. But here it is. Here it is. Go figure it out. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. And it's, um, it's a great American right to build choice. Right? Like that's the great American privilege yeah. is the privilege of choice. Yeah. And um, I think of this as I really feel like the the right to f good meat and the right to have access to clean meat, it's like a human right, the right to decommodify and ask for things and get them in ways that align with your values and the world you want your kids to be part of. Like, these are the things that we have to, we have to fight for. And lobby for is not the right word because I don't think it's going to be solved by the government. I think the right word is fight for and, and buy into. No, you're right. As I said earlier, these companies are not interested in anything except bottom line and making money. And um, we have to figure it out ourselves. And I got to tell you, when I started flying again several months ago after the whole COVID debacle settled down a bit, the first airport I landed in uh, for a connecting flight was Atlanta. And I was shocked. People in the last year, people have gained even more weight to a point where you can visibly see it. Right. Yeah. And as I, I always say on the show, we're going to break under the weight of our own weight, our healthcare system will not be able to keep up. We're not keeping up now. Yeah. 
And it's only getting worse. And we have to figure out how to turn the ship around. And as you know, when you turn a ship around, you can't do a U turn, right? It takes a while to get that thing going in the other direction and then doing a 180. But that's exactly what we have to do. Uh, Anya, um, if you don't have Villa Capelli olive oil already, you need to write this down and go right now and get Villa Capelli, the longest running sponsor of the show, nine years. Nine years, Villa Capelli has been sponsoring this show dutifully, and we love him over here. The, the owner, Paul Capelli, passed away on us about a year and a half ago. His husband, Stephen Crutchfield, said, hey, we're continuing. I'm going to keep crushing olives, and you guys in America can keep getting olives. 60% of, um, not 60%, but you are allowed to cut your olive oil up to 40% in this country, not Villa Capelli. It's 100% pure olive oil every single time you will taste the difference. I always tell people it's a it's a salad dressing all on its own. If you want to save 10% every time, put in promo code Vinny V I N N I E no wimpy Y you get 10% off. If after that 10% you're over $100 free shipping. So get all their herbs and everything else they have there. They also have the KTM oil. It's olive oil with a peppery flavor to it. They, the lemon olive oil is also another favorite. Go check it all out at Villa Capelli Olive Oil, promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, and you will save 10%. Anya, I hate keeping you for this long, but any parting words before I let you go? It's just always a pleasure, Vinny. Thanks for hearing me. Um, I want to just talk about cooking next time we talk. Just cooking. Listen, whenever you want to come on. I I talk about food. Um, oh, but I feel like we need to do it in in person. Like we gotta. Get I want to do a person an in person podcast where we do the video and the whole thing. We got to figure that out. I'm, I'm in California now, about every second month, I'm, I'm traveling there more now. I know you just go to LA where all the cool kids are, but come up to Dorky. That's, that's how I earn my living, man. I, yeah, <laughs> I I'm come on up to NorCal, but even if you're down in LA, we'll we'll hook you up and give you a burger at the restaurant. I can go. I don't need a free burger. I just need to. I need to get to your place. I want to we're to we gotta we gotta, yeah. we gotta get down. Yeah, um, we, we got to do this for real, and uh, we got to video it and just do the whole thing. Also, I want, I want two things. Um, I want you to hit me up with the vitamin. I'll, I'll check out your vitamin club. I'd love to try that. I've been working yeah. on my supplement game as I make my way through my 40s and look to maintain my optimal. You're in your 40s? I'm, I'm at the back half of my 40s, my friend. Serious? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm 46. I, I wouldn't have ever guessed that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, good diet goes a long way. I actually don't even do anything in my skin. Yeah, I was about to say you don't have a wrinkle on you. Yeah, I mean, I get that all the time. I look, I look better in my forties than I do in my thirties um, because my diet's so much better. Um, but just lots of you, I eat like literally two pounds of meat a day. So I, <laughs> you and I are about we're about the same rate. I eat. People go, you just eat meat once a day. It's like you should see the amount I eat. I know, I know, it's a lot. Yeah. And actually, and then I wanted to shout out um, to for your listeners, and I'll I'll send you some information on this. But I am going to be doing a couple different meal plans and meal protocols okay. um, that are culinary, um, just to share like what how you do it, how you plan for it, the kind of thing I was talking about with like kofta and prepping and that kind of stuff. So. I'd love to to share that. Um, Let, let's you. bring you back soon. And we'll just do a whole food thing. Maybe you could be in your kitchen. Yeah, and we can prepare something. Well, Anna you know, does that on the show all the time. Thanksgiving's right around the corner, right? Yeah, but you don't want to do a whole Thanksgiving meal, right? We I mean, can talk about how to cook Thanksgiving for health. I'm down for that. Anna, Anna, I'm I'm calling you Anya. I'm calling you Anna now because Anna does cooking on on the show. She just sets up a camera in her kitchen and she's cooking away. Let's do, Let's do this in the next couple of weeks. Let's do a Friday show where you do a, a cooking something. I'm down for it. Why don't we do like meal prep for the week? I love it. That's okay. Good. That's okay. going to be our next Friday show. We'll bring in meal prep okay. for the week. Email me now so that we could get it done within the next several weeks. Okay. I'm here for right. it. Thank Hang you. on. I want to say goodbye to you. Okay. Hang on. I want to say goodbye to you off the air. Folks, if you like what's going on here, before you go to Amazon, go to VinnyTotteries.com, click through the banner. It puts coal on the fire, gets my train down the track, and I'm able to keep this show free for a gazillion years in a row. Also, uh, we have the super fan page at VinnyTotteries.com, so go check that out. Also, check out Bel Campo, 15% off, promo code Vinny, so check that out. On behalf of Anya Fernald, my name is Vinny Totterich. 
put life into living and do it with enthusiasm.